these are turned out 36, I guess. Thirty-six, something like that. People. Good evening. Welcome to Coil Ridge Books and Music. This evening, we're honored to have with us the author Joseph Whelan. Joe has written extensively, um, and. I think 11 books to his credit. Before he began full-time writing, he was a, a reporter and an editor for the Associated Press. Uh, Joe's writings have received critical acclaim. His most recent book is Bloody Spring, 40 Days That Sealed the Confeder Confederacy's Fate. Um, it's getting rave reviews already. Kirkus Reviews writes, this is well-researched and argued a text that Civil War scholars and buffs will consume with glee. Please welcome Joseph Green. Well, thank you uh, for inviting me to Coil Ridge again. Uh, I really appreciate it. I hope you're all doing well tonight, and thank you for coming. Um, I'm here to talk about my latest book, Bloody Spring, which uh, I say that it is the uh, campaign that sealed the fate of the Confederacy. Um, the Union campaign in Virginia that I describe in Bloody Spring spanned six weeks in May and June of 1864 exactly 150 years ago. In my book, I make the case that the chain of battles fought by Ulysses S. Grant's army was the Civil War's major turning point. There are excellent books about the campaign's major battles, but usually this campaign is presented as part of a larger history of the war. Surprisingly few one-volume books attempt to tell the story of the Overland Campaign. I decided to write one. The names of the major battles, the Wilderness, Spotsylvania Courthouse, Cold Harbor, aren't especially well known and do not resonate like Shiloh and Antietam, Vicksburg, and Gettysburg. But for more than 40 days, the Army of the Potomac and Robert E. Lee's Army of Northern Virginia were in nearly continual contact as Grant marched from the Rapidan River in northern Virginia to the gates of Petersburg, 100 miles away. Men were killed every day, sometimes in great numbers. This type of warfare was new to North America. As one general said, the carnage became such that the loss of a thousand men in a day was considered no great matter. The romantic chivalry with which the war began had vanished in three years of bloodletting. During the spring of 1864, Grant would prosecute the war as no other Union general had. He would ruthlessly press his great advantages in numbers, logistics, and firepower against Lee's army. During this campaign, the combatants slaughtered one another in shocking numbers. Both armies made mistakes, but mainly both armies bled. Together they lost 100,000 men killed, wounded, or captured over six weeks. Despite Grant's lack of victories, the campaign shifted the initiative permanently to the Union and pinned Lee to Petersburg and Richmond. Lee was never able to launch another major offensive. President Abraham Lincoln needed a military victory in the East if he hoped to win re-election in the fall of 1864. He was not optimistic about being re-elected. His defeat would mean peace and the Confederacy's survival as a sovereign nation. Lincoln was frustrated by his Eastern Army's failures over the past three years despite its huge advantages of manpower and resources. His eastern generals had been timid and slow, and when they did fight, they typically withdrew after one defeat. 
Twice they allowed Lee's army to escape over the Potomac into Virginia. The list of failed Union generals was long and included George McClellan, John Pope, Ambrose Burnside, and Joe Hooker. Lincoln pinned all of his hopes on a Western general, Grant, and made him general in chief of all the Union armies in March 1864, sweeping authority never before bestowed on a Union general. Grant was a quiet, impassive man who won battles while chain smoking cigars. He had a reputation as a strategist who never gave up. Grant's 1863 victories at Vicksburg and Chattanooga had made him famous. When Grant came to Washington in March 1864 to meet Lincoln and War Secretary Edwin Stanton for the first time, he was the object of intense curiosity. Grant did not look the part of a great general. He was of medium height, below medium weight. He wore a private's nondescript blue uniform with his general stars sewn on the shoulders. One man said he was an ordinary scrubby looking man with a slightly seedy look. But someone else saw something different. The look of a man determined to drive his head through a brick wall. Disliking Washington and its show business, as he called it, Grant chose to direct all the armies while in the field with the Army of the Potomac, commanded by George Meade. With the exception of its great victory at Gettysburg, this was a hard luck army. It was well equipped, very large, and slow. In the Army's sprawling winter camp along the Rapidan River in northern Virginia, Grant brought in every available eastern unit until he had over 100,000 men. Across the river was the Army of Northern Virginia. Inferior in numbers and weaponry, Lee's army was well led. It fought superbly and moved fast. The two armies had fought every year of the, of the war and knew practically everything that there was to know about one another. As General-in-Chief, Grant planned a massive campaign against rebel armies everywhere at once to prevent the enemy from shifting troops from quiet sectors to active ones. He would go for Lee, and his friend William Sherman would go for General Joseph Johnston and Atlanta. The Army of the James would menace Richmond, and offenses were planned in the Shenandoah Valley and at Mobile, Alabama. Grant, as he said, intended <clears throat> to hammer continuously until, he said, by mere attrition, if no other way, there should be nothing left to him but surrender. That's what he said of Robert E. Lee. A British historian described Grant's campaign as a massive wheel by the right wing, while the Union's western armies would march south and east and ultimately into Lee's rear, Grant would pin Lee's army to Virginia. Wednesday, May 4th, was the day fixed for the campaign's start. Lee and Grant had never met in combat, but they were their respective armies, most aggressive commanders. North of the Rapidan, Grant had three infantry corps, the 2nd, the 5th, and the 6th under Generals Winfield Scott Hancock, Gouverneur Warren, and John Sedgwick, and Phil Sheridan commanded the Cavalry Corps. Sheridan was the only Western commander that Grant had brought east with him. A fourth infantry corps, the Ninth Corps, under Ambrose Burnside, was on the way. It would give Grant 120,000 men, the largest army ever fielded by the Union. South of the river and to the west were Lee's 66,000 soldiers, ready to fight the Yankees when they crossed the Rapidan. This was the Confederacy's best army. Its three infantry corps, the first, second, and third, were led by James Longstreet, Richard Ewell, and A.P. Hill. The famed rebel cavalry was commanded by Jeb Stewart. In 18